In all known natural languages, every noun in any given sentence will fill a certain role in the way it relates to the action described by the verb. Most verb phrases require at least two roles to be filled, namely the subject or agent, the noun performing the action, and the direct object or patient, the noun receiving the action. And some verbs may also require an indirect object or beneficiary of the action. The words in the phrase that fill these mandatory roles are called arguments, while most other roles will just provide extra optional information that isn't necessary for the phrase to make sense, and so are instead termed adjuncts. It's critically important then for a language to have a means of making clear what any given word's role is, otherwise phrases will be impossible or at least very difficult to interpret. Across all known natural languages, there are three main ways this role marking can be accomplished. The most common is to have a default word order, so the noun's roles can be gleaned from their position in the sentence. About 87% of languages sampled by the World Atlas of Language Structures have a default word order of some kind, though there's considerable variation in word order patterns between, and sometimes even within, individual languages. However, using word order alone is comparatively rare as a role marking strategy, as it's most often complemented with one of the other two role marking mechanisms. About 60% of surveyed languages make use of grammatical case, wherein each noun is explicitly marked for its role by means of an affix, while around 80% of languages employ verb agreement, where the verb is marked with affixes that agree with at least one of the arguments in person, number, and or gender, allowing the listener to infer who's doing what to whom based on the verb's inflection. Some languages only mark the subject on the verb, which is the case for most European languages, a very small number of languages mark just the object, usually as a result of ergativity or some other complications pertaining to morphosyntactic alignment, but more than half of all languages with verb agreement mark both the subject and the object, and occasionally the indirect object or other roles as well, a phenomenon called polypersonal agreement. Verb agreement most often evolves when pronouns become phonologically dependent on the verb and are then incorporated into it to become affixes at which point the verb can no longer occur without them. This means that in languages with polypersonal agreement, most often the verb will be given one set of affixes to mark the subject, and a separate set for the object, and they'll usually come in the same or a similar order relative to each other and to the verb as they did before they were incorporated. Although once polypersonal agreement evolves, it often allows for increased flexibility in word order. Since the pronouns are already expressed on the verb, their roles can be inferred even if they're entirely omitted from the sentence. Languages that routinely exclude pronouns in this way are called prodrop languages, and although not all prodrop languages exhibit verb agreement, the extra information provided by verb agreement makes pronoun dropping especially likely. Very often in prodrop languages, including the pronoun serves to place focus on it or to highlight its role in the phrase. Somewhat related to pronoun dropping is the cross-linguistic tendency for a third-person singular subject to not be marked overtly, but instead to be inferred from a lack of marking. Basically, unless anything suggests otherwise, the default assumption is usually that the subject is third-person. The plurality of verb arguments is most often inherently expressed with the person markers, since they derive from pronouns that already reflect grammatical number. But some polypersonal languages also mark the plurality of either one or both of the arguments elsewhere on the verb as well, a feature that sometimes gets called verbal number, or pluractionality. In languages like classical Nahuatl, the verb takes additional plural marking only for the subject, while in others like Navajo, the verbal plural marker can signify either a plural subject, or plural object, or both, depending on context. Pluractionality most often evolves from frequentative or distributive aspect marking, signifying that the verb happens multiple times, which then becomes inextricably associated with the verb having multiple participants, and so the marking is reanalyzed as a sort of verbal plural. As for the person markers themselves, in most polypersonal languages, the subject and object affixes will come in a consistent order, and which marker refers to the subject, and which refers to the object, will be interpreted from their position in the verb template. But occasionally, certain combinations of subjects and objects will be encoded simultaneously with a single inseparable affix that's often not phonologically or etymologically related to the expected subject and object markers. This is called portmanteau agreement, 
and while there's still research being done into exactly how this comes about, there is some evidence that it evolves when more general person markers take on additional implications of meaning, such as how in Guarani, the portmanteau marker that simultaneously encodes a first-person plural subject and a second-person singular object seems to have evolved from an extended use of the intransitive first-person plural inclusive subject marker. Basically, you and I do something got reinterpreted as we do something to you. And for one final variation on polypersonalism, let's talk about direct inverse systems. In these systems, the position of the subject and object markers don't conform to any predetermined order in the verb template, but instead according to what's called a person hierarchy, which in all attested cases has either the first or second person at the top, then the third person below those, and then any other persons the language might distinguish, such as inanimate or obvious third person, at the very bottom. Each of the persons included in the hierarchy will have an invariable slot in the verb template, regardless of the role they play in the phrase, which means the identity of the subject and object can't be inferred from the person marking alone. Instead, the default assumption is that it's the argument higher on the hierarchy doing something to the argument lower on the hierarchy, and if this isn't the case, then a special inverse marker is added to the verb to let the listener know that the expected roles have been reversed. So how does this sort of system evolve? The answer has to do with salience and animacy. There's a prevalent cross-linguistic tendency for languages to place greater focus, either grammatically or syntactically, on animate arguments rather than inanimate ones. Which makes sense, considering humans generally like to talk about one another, and that inanimate objects don't really have any agency of their own, or any ability to carry out any independent actions. This is exemplified by languages like Blackfoot, in which inanimate nouns are simply forbidden from serving as the subjects of transitive verbs, and by languages like Navajo, wherein the nouns in a sentence must come in order of animacy as dictated by a strict hierarchy. And if this order doesn't correspond to the order of the subject and the object, then the third person object marker changes to reflect this. The person hierarchies seen in direct inverse languages are an extension of this idea, with animacy distinctions being made among grammatical persons as well. The higher up on the hierarchy an argument is, the more animate it's perceived to be, and so the more likely it is to be the subject. However, if, counter to expectations, the more animate argument isn't the one performing the verb, the language may make use of valency or voicing tricks, like for example the passive voice, to keep the animate argument as the subject. Over time, as the pronouns get incorporated into the verb to become agreement markers, the passive becomes a necessary and mandatory component of the role marking system, and so thereby becomes an inverse marker. Those are just some of the main ways that verb agreement can manifest, but marking roles solely through verb agreement may open up a few ambiguities that might need to be clarified with other strategies. One common issue that arises is how to interpret the verb if both arguments are third person. In such a case, how do you tell who's the subject and who's the object? One way to clear this up is to rely on grammatical gender. If the person marking on the verb agrees with the arguments in gender as well, then as long as the arguments have different genders, it will still be clear who's doing what to whom. A very common distinction to make is in animate versus inanimate arguments. As already mentioned, most of the time subjects will be animate and objects inanimate, and so this distinction may also present itself in person marking. A language like Swahili takes this to a greater extreme, having around 18 different noun classes, each having a unique verb agreement prefix, so most of the time the identities of the subject and the object are abundantly clear. Alternatively, another strategy for disambiguation is obviation, which involves two different third-person markers, one for the proximate argument, or the one that's most central to what's being discussed, and one for any other third-person arguments, which are termed obviate arguments, which are either less relevant to the conversation than the proximate argument, or are considered background information. Obviation is very strongly correlated with direct inverse systems, as can be seen in the Algonquin languages like Plains, Cree, and Ojibwe, which also have an animacy distinction on top of obviation to further minimize ambiguity. Finally, a language with verb agreement may clarify roles by simultaneously using either one of the other two role marking mechanisms, word order or noun case. As mentioned earlier, the majority of the world's languages have a default word order, 
and even though having a different role marking strategy helps to add some extra flexibility, it's still handy to have a default word order to disambiguate things if necessary. Classical Nahuatl primarily uses polypersonal agreement to clarify roles, and therefore allows the constituents of a phrase to come in pretty much any order the speaker wants. But if any ambiguity arises, it falls back on a default word order of verb, subject, object. While Swahili still uses a consistent subject, verb, object word order, despite its pervasive person and gender marking. Combining verb agreement with noun case is a little bit rarer, but it's fairly common in European languages like Greek and Latin, which mark the subject on the verb, but also have a robust case system while keeping word order pretty flexible. It's also interesting to note that many of the Romance languages that descend from Latin have lost the case system outside of personal pronouns, but have compensated for it with a much stricter word order. Having noun case and polypersonal agreement is quite rare, but can be seen in languages like Basque and Georgian, the latter of which also has a fairly consistent word order as well. All languages are redundant to some extent, and so may end up double marking one or more roles to reinforce meaning. For your own conlang, feel free to use a mix of these strategies to employ as much or as little role marking as makes sense, so long as it's at least reasonably clear who's doing what to whom. So in summary, if you want to create a conlang that uses verb agreement, decide which roles are going to be marked on the verb, whether it's the subject, object, indirect object, and or other roles, incorporate pronouns into the verb complex to become agreement morphology, Determine any additional morphology the paradigm might include, such as plurationality, portmanteau agreement, or inverse marking. And decide what other role marking strategies may be used to eliminate ambiguity. Overall, verb agreement presents the possibility for a wide variety of unique and interesting grammatical features, and can serve as a very useful tool for any conlanger's repertoire.